Welcome to Angels and Seer Stones. I'm Chris. And I'm Christine. Today we're discussing stories of the Savior appearing in Latter-day Saint temples. We'll start with Joseph Smith's vision of the Savior in the Kirtland, Ohio Temple, move on to appearances in the Salt Lake City Temple, and then to more recent stories about Jesus coming to other houses of worship around the world. Latter-day Saints are a people of radical faith. We are a unique body of Bible-believing Christians. For us, the scriptural canon has been opened. The traditional sacraments have expanded. Our beliefs and practices are steeped in universalism, esotericism, and apocalypticism. The Latter-day Saint tradition is a religion in which angels visit everyday people, and sometimes men and women see the divine in stones. In this podcast, we examine the lived religion of Latter-day Saints, the stories we tell, and the beliefs we debate. We take seriously the whole gambit of Latter-day Saint experience. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Angels and Seer Stories. So we're talking about instances when Jesus Christ appeared in temples. This is something Latter-day Saints really believe. I've encountered many stories, both legend and personal narrative, that support this. Absolutely. These are houses of the Lord. It reminds us of Jesus' comment in the Gospel of Matthew. The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Latter-day Saints often comment that while Jesus was not welcome in the Jerusalem temple during his lifetime, he has a home, or should we say homes, today. You know what? Instead of starting with the Kirtland Temple vision, which we'll get to, let's start with a segment from a general conference talk from Elder Henry B. Eyring. October 2012. Check it out. My three-year-old granddaughter illustrated the power of innocence and humility to connect us with God. She went with her family to the open house of the Brigham City Temple in Utah. In one of the rooms of that beautiful building, she looked around and asked, Mommy, where is Jesus? Her mother explained that she would not see Jesus in the temple, but she would be able to feel his influence in her heart. Eliza carefully considered her mother's response and then seemed satisfied and said, Oh, Jesus is gone helping someone, she concluded. No pavilion obscured Eliza's understanding or obstructed her view of reality. God is close to her, and she feels close to him. She knew that the temple is the house of the Lord, but also understood that the resurrected and glorified Jesus Christ has a body and can only be in one place at a time. If he was not at his house, she recognized that he must be in another place. And for for what she knows of the Savior, she knew that he would be somewhere doing good for his father's children. It was clear that she had hoped to see Jesus not for a confirming miracle of his existence, but simply because she loved him. This is so sweet. Here, Elder Iring praises his granddaughter for her faith in taking our belief in temples as the house of the Lord, literally. This is a powerful story. I can imagine some people hearing it and seeing it as a story of childlike naivete. And it's certainly cute, but I don't think that's Elder Iring's point. It's an example of the radical belief that is a deep component of traditional Latter-day Saint identity. And our middle kiddo asked a similar question when he was a bit younger, so I imagine this is a fairly common experience. And we'll come back to this idea, but let's first talk about how we got to this point, outside, of course, the mere linguistics we use to describe this building. The idea that the temple is a literal house of the Lord first appears after the saints dedicate the Kirtland, Ohio temple. And as you all know, this was the first dedicated house of the Lord. So Joseph Smith speaks the dedicatory prayer and asks God to accept the building as his own. In response, Jesus Christ actually appears to Joseph and Oliver Cowdery. The veil was taken from our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were opened. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold in color like amber. His eyes were as a flame of fire, the hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was like the sound of the rushing of great waters. Even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, 
your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me, therefore lift up your heads and rejoice. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice, and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have with their might built this house to my name. For behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. I love this passage for lots of reasons, but one of them is that when Joseph tried to describe this experience of seeing the Savior, he borrowed from the language of John the Revelator in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. His feet like amber, his eyes like a flame of fire, his voice like the rushing of great waters. I imagine somewhere there's a critic assuming this is plagiarism, but of course Joseph knew this passage, and he knew that this passage in Revelations would be familiar to many. Presumably, he thought John gave an apt description of the resurrected Jesus. And the language is powerful. I imagine Joseph felt a kinship with John, having experiencing something near ineffable. But for this podcast, this scene is important because it's the first appearance of Jesus in a dedicated house of the Lord. The Savior shows up to accept the temple, and then Joseph and Oliver have a series of three other visitations, one from Moses, then Elias, then finally Elijah, each imparting keys that will be used by the saints. This experience sets the scene for further expectations that Christ will appear in temples. In fact, there is some level of disappointment after the completion of other temples that Jesus doesn't personally show up to accept the building. After the appearance of Christ in the Kirtland Temple, I think the most well-known story of this type is that of Lorenzo Snows. I I suspect this one will be familiar to many of our listeners. The story is told by the granddaughter of Lorenzo Snow, Allie Young Pond. One evening while I was visiting Grandpa Snow in his room in the Salt Lake Temple, I remained until the doorkeepers had gone and the night watchmen had not yet come in, so Grandpa said he would take me to the main front entrance and let me out that way. He got his bunch of keys from his dresser. After we left his room, and while we were still in the large corridor leading into the celestial room, I was walking several steps ahead of Grandpa when he stopped me and said, Wait a moment, Allie. I want to tell you something. It was right here that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me at the time of the death of President Woodruff. He instructed me to go right ahead and reorganize the First Presidency of the Church at once and not wait has been done after the death of the previous Presidents and that I was to succeed President Woodruff. Then Grandpa came a step nearer and held out his left hand and said, He stood right there, about three feet above the floor. It looked as though he stood on a plate of solid gold. Then he came another step nearer and put his right hand on my head and said, Now, granddaughter, I want you to remember that this is the testimony of your grandfather and that he told you with his own lips that he actually saw the Savior here in the temple and talked with him face to face. This is one of the most well-known events in the history of the Salt Lake Temple. You know, I can remember visiting the Salt Lake Temple and stopping at the staircase where I believed it to occur, a winding case with a towering painting of the Savior. I was a youngster back then, so I can't quite remember why I thought it occurred at that particular landing. A bit of folklore passed down onto me, I assume, a young convert. If any of our listeners have been told or shown this location, please email us or leave us a message. A new legend cycle of Jesus visiting his temples started to circulate in the 1970s. Here's a story recorded by Christy Bell in the fall of 1977. Keep in mind, the Provo, Utah Temple was finished five years earlier. The president of one of the Utah temples looked out of his house one night and noticed that there was a light on in the temple. This at first seemed odd to him because he had locked up that night and remembered turning all the lights off. But then he felt as though nothing was wrong, and so he retired, thinking nothing more about it. The next morning, he received a call from the prophet Joseph Fielding Smith who told him that the Savior had visited his temple the night before and found everything in order. So a mysterious light in the temple clues us in that the Savior had visited his his temple. 
Um, this really reminds us of how ancient Israelites saw evidence that God himself had blessed the temple. And that he'd done so through a pillar of fire, a light that shows up at the temple in the evenings. A story from the Wilson Archives, recorded by Clyde B. Wilson in 1976, gives another variant of this legend cycle. One night, shortly after the dedication of the Washington, D.C. Temple, when the temple workers had completed their work and had gone home, the temple president remained in his office to complete some unfinished business. As he was working, he heard footsteps out in the hall. He investigated, but could find no one. He returned to his desk and had, in a few minutes later, heard more footsteps. He was very puzzled and investigated more closely, but still could find no evidence of anyone out in the hall. As he returned to his desk, the phone rang. President Kimball was calling to ask the temple president if anything unusual was happening. After the temple president had explained what happened, President Kimball told him that it was the Savior who had just been to the Salt Lake Temple, and he told President Kimball that he was extremely pleased with the work in the Washington Temple and was going to visit it. In both of these stories, a strange experience with the Temple President is confirmed by the Prophet as being an appearance of the Savior. This follows a structure we see a lot in LDS folklore. The Prophet conveys the importance of a somewhat confusing but otherwise ordinary experience, footsteps in a hall. This also shows up in sacred writ. Remember the boy prophet Samuel who heard the voice of God while living in the temple? It's the high priest Eli that makes sense of God's call. That's a really cool parallel. So I want to conclude with a personal experience. In 2005, as a missionary, I became acquainted with Sister Pennington in Sissonville, West Virginia. She and her husband had been on a mission serving in the Washington, D.C. temple. I remember her telling me that one day she was walking down one of the temple corridors when she was struck with the awareness that the Savior himself had walked those halls. She teared up as she bore this testimony. I didn't know what to make of it then, but I remember asking myself whether I really thought Jesus visited the temples. Yeah, so these sort of bold claims show up everywhere in the Latter-day Saint tradition. They invite believers to wrestle with their own beliefs. And I decided I thought such a thing could happen, and has happened, even if I knew that it would be an oddity. Even if I knew that the old folk image of the Twelve Apostles sitting down to hold meetings with the Savior probably wasn't true, but that the temple was in fact the Savior's house remained as an essential for me. I wonder if viewing the temple as the literal house of the Lord in some ways parallels to the experience of Christians, including Latter-day Saints visiting Israel, the Holy Land in which they emphasize the fact that they are walking where the Savior has walked. This is one way that the temple becomes a sort of pilgrimage site. I'd sure love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Angels and Seer Stones. If you have heard a story about the Savior appearing in the temple, we'd love to hear it. I love all the emails we get each week. We try to respond to every letter. Forgive us if it takes a few days. Please share Angels and Seer Stones with a friend or on your social media and rate the podcast online. See you guys next week. See you soon. We'd like to thank our voice actors, Devin Blythe of Virginia, Katie Deal, and Liz Busby of Brigham Young University, Melvin C. Johnson, author of Life and Times of John Pierce Hawley and Mormon Ulysses of the American West, and Mark Magula of Delray Beach, Florida. We couldn't have done it without you. Angels and Seer Stones is a proud member of the Dialogue Podcast Network. You can support this podcast and others in our network by subscribing at dialoguejournal.com.